Um, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to be part of the, uh, the conclave and support the work that the ICT Academy uh, is doing here in, uh, in Kerala. I feel very privileged to have the opportunity to uh, address you today um, from Oracle Academy as part of your conference. And I, I know what it feels like to be sitting here in the first you know, minutes of, the, uh, of a two-day two conference and the anticipation and the excitement and the energy that, uh, that you have as you em embark on the journey in discussing what I think is a, you know, is a fascinating uh, topic. We are um, very grateful for the opportunity to participate today. As um, you know, uh, I come from Oracle Academy, which is a part of the Oracle Corporation. And our role is a great one. We are all about supporting educators, education institutions, in advancing computer science globally. And we look to do that in the best way that we can. And to do so, we like to work with organisations such as the ICT Academy to understand how we, uh, we do that. So to the, to the CEO and, uh, and, and Chairman of the ICT Academy, we are uh, looking forward to this ongoing relationship uh, as we progress in this important state uh, of India in the context of your very important um, global, uh, sorry, your very important national uh, initiatives. Our partnership um, is a great one, and I'm uh, ably supported by my colleague, uh, Banu. Banu, you might like to stand up, so if you haven't met Banu, please uh, make yourself known to her. Banu uh, lives in Bangalore, but spends a lot of time traveling around this, uh, this amazing country of yours. I have the pleasure of talking to you about the fourth generation industrial revolution. Um, and I'd like to do so by setting the context. And the context really around what is this? What is uh, the consideration that we need to put into this industrial revolution? Where are we? And why is it important? Over the next, four next two days, I should say, you are going to be hearing a lot about technology. Artificial intelligence, robotics, the changing nature of work, big data, the, the fusion of physical and digital, the changing nature of work and the role of the human in all of that. Today I'm going to take a slightly different tack as we introduce that topic and, and share with you, I think, in the spirit of providing a context, what I think is an important consideration, and I'll get to that. In my research on this topic, I came across this excellent publication written by uh, Mr. Klaus Schwab, um, a German professor at the University of Geneva, um, and indeed has a book called The Fourth Industrial Revolution, and I'd encourage you to, um, to have a look at that. It has very good reviews, at least on Amazon. <laughs> um, and I just share with you this opening statement as we sit here at the head of the two-day conference. We do not yet know just how it will unfold. But one thing is clear. The response to it must be integrated and comprehensive, involving all stakeholders of the global policy, from the public and private sectors to academia and civil society. And what I love particularly about this is that this is something that is saying this is all our revolution. This is not the economist's revolution. This is not the socialist's revolution. This is not the education revolution. This is all of our revolution. And we all play a role in that because our societies are not an economy. We are a society made up of humans that enjoy certain benefits as we develop. The fourth industrial revolution, I think, although our opening uh, address addressed some of these, we are now at supposedly the fourth revolution, the first being where obviously steam generated power and gave us the ability to transform many things that we were doing in the world, in industry. We'll look back on that. The second revolution was really the evolution of that into the use of electric power and other uh, forms of power and how that changed the mass production 
that we've come to know today. The third revolution, obviously, is the one that we are quite familiar with, which is the information revolution, which obviously gave us the adoption of a globalization, the ability to access huge amounts of information to benefit our society. But this fourth industrial revolution is focused around digital. And the ability for us now to live in this connected world, with all of the advances that that brings. And as we say here, it is blurring the lines between the physical, the digital, and indeed the biological spheres. But the fourth revolution, I guess the question should be asked, is, is it really different? Is it really different from the third revolution, the information age that we witnessed over the last part of the, the 20th century? I think some would say, no, it's not different. But others would say, yes, um, it is different. Um, the speed with which things are happening. Um, quite frankly, I, I live in the technology sector. That's the industry that I work in, although I focus around the education sector, which arguably is even more important because we're supposed to be at the front end of where the technology sector is, is going. And I can say that I find it difficult to keep up with the amount of progress that is happening um, in this digitized world. It, um, it's, it scares me. And I know, I know people of my parents' generation who have just said, I give up. <laughs> I, just, I just can't keep going with the amount of change, the speed. Obviously, the disruption is something that no doubt you'll be hearing about over the next two days. And that's very important for us because um, it defines the fact that we need to identify uh, what the, the future of our industry is going to be. And importantly, you know, what the future of work is for us as participants in this civilization. And finally, I think it's the, the question around the breadth and depth of all the changes, that this is not something that is just focused around a particular sector. This is all pervasive. It's global. It reaches into every community. As I, as I drive around the streets of India um, in wonderment about how people are balancing on the back of a motorbike and they've got a mobile phone in their hand, um, and you wonder, <laughs> you know, how do we do this? But, but what are they doing on that phone? And, and, and how is that changing and improving their lives? It's fascinating. The fourth industrial revolution. Whether we like it or not, this revolution is happening. Yeah, it, it is happening. Uh, and we're part of it. And just like trying to upgrade to the next version of the iPhone and the applications that we have to put on it, it's happening and we have to keep pace with it. But of course, it's bringing around a whole heap of new changes, the economy. It's identifying ways for us, hopefully, to be able to share the incredible wealth that our civilization is building uh, generation on generation. It's exposing inequalities. It's exposing inequalities and giving us the possibility and the potential for us as a society to address those inequalities in ways that we didn't potentially have to before. New ways to work, obviously. New ways to live, to travel, the way we live, the houses we live in, the shops we buy in, the way we, sh well, the way we shop, the way we don't go to shops. Um, obviously our leisure and, and the, the immense uh, area that's uh, versioning around how does this digital environment affect the way we live from a health uh, point of view and where are the biosciences going with this. And importantly, we're seeing how this digitization is affecting the way we can educate and learn. But is it really different from the revolutions that we've had previously? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I want to, I'd like to take you on a, uh, a journey, all, all in providing some context as to why, uh, why we're here today. I'd like to take you to Paris, to Paris in the year 1900, in what was commonly referred to as the Belle Epoque, the beautiful time, La Belle Epoque. Paris 1900, and I'd like you to think, and uh, from your knowledge of Paris and the movies that we see constantly around Paris, that you're now sitting in a cafe in Paris, in the streets of Paris in 1900, and you are having a coffee before you go to the Paris exhibition, the grand exposition of 1900, which saw the completion of the Eiffel Tower and which saw the introduction and display of many new technologies. 
And as you're sitting there having that cup of coffee and smelling the coffee and hearing the noise of the streets, sometimes the clip-clop of the horses and sometimes the, the movement of a motor car, you'd be sitting there in your beautiful new fabrics saying, this is amazing. What a wonderful time we live in and how things have changed. There was indeed, after the Industrial Revolution, incredible social upheaval and importantly, great inequalities that had been able to exist were being exposed and addressed. And uh, fundamentally, that is a big part of the revolution that we knew. But by the time we get to sitting in that cafe in Paris, apart from uh, obviously the decline of the, the colonization of the world and, and revolutions like Russia, which took a little bit longer to happen in the, in, until the 20, 20th century, uh, we were living in a world which saw incredible wealth for a large part of the society. The rise of the middle class, the decline of the aristocracy and the expansion of the middle class, and the, the exposure of the inequalities of the working class. Incredible changes. In fact, in Paris, around that time, the changes were so incredible that the leadership of that country at the time basically transformed the city by demolishing most of it and rebuilding it into the beautiful Paris that we see today as part of the Haussmann concept. So those amazing boulevards that we see in Paris and then reflected in many other cities around the world were largely a part of the wealth that was generated by the incredible advances in technology brought about by the Industrial Revolution. So we as humans, as a society, we embrace that wealth and advanced it. And if you are not impressed by the grandeur of walking around the city of Paris, um, then uh, I, I'd have to have a talk with you. <laughs> um, of course, that technology was all pervasive. If you think about the fact that we were introducing motor vehicles, that we were introducing subways, that we were introducing trains, we were introducing aircraft in that period of the Belle Epoque, these are incredible changes. And when we flew uh, yesterday into, uh, or last night into Trivandrum, as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm sitting in a wonderful aircraft and I'm able to watch a movie while I'm on that aircraft, but actually, this would not be possible if it was not for the, for the science and technology that was born of the Belle Epoque, the Industrial Revolution, number one. Not only that, of course, talking from a human point of view, but it gave us the opportunity to see and conceive of our world in a different way. The invention of the camera, the, the invention of cinema, all happened in this wonderful time where, importantly, technology was embraced. It's when the Impressionists, uh, the Impressionist artists, at least from that part of the world, were able to help us see our world in a different way, which was not based on old structures. None of this would have been possible if it was not for our scientists and the technology that they were able to embrace and build on. And I think, for me, when I think of the Belle Epoque, um, it's a little bit like that movie that's, uh, where, the, where the lady could travel back in time and she chooses to go to the Belle Epoque. I think, for a large part, this is the time that I would love to visit, at least for a while, because I think it, it must have been an amazing development, not only in technology, but in the way society embraced that technology. Technology was a defining factor, bringing in incredible change. So where are we now? We're still sitting in the cafe in Paris. Well now, let's go back to the future and let's have a look at a, uh, a description of what the world can look like by um, this uh, futurist. It's a short video that I'd like to share with you before I close. Once upon a time, business as usual was often good enough. No more. Where we are going, good enough is dead. In a world where everything is connected, where everything is equally excellent, where performance is reaching perfection, there's only one space left to innovate in. You. Right now, you are a central point in the raging tornado of change fueled by digitization, mobilization, augmentation, disintermediation, automation, while well, the list goes on. Science fiction is becoming science fact. Think about self-driving cars or computers that can learn and think. 
The way we work will never be the same. The skills we need will be dramatically different. Winning or losing are now happening faster than ever before. So what's your response? How will you discover new opportunities in one of the most transformational times in human history? Are you driving change or are you being driven by it? Disruption has become the new normal. With change, it's always gradually, then suddenly, well, things really have stopped happening gradually. This change is exponential. Everything that used to be dumb and disconnected is now wired and intelligent. Cars, cities, ports, farms, even our bodies will be wired with sensors and will talk to each other. These game changes are also combinatorial. They amplify each other, creating a perfect storm of change. Quantum computing fuels big data. The Internet of Things fuels artificial intelligence and deep learning, which fuels robotics. However, anything that cannot be digitized or automated will become extremely valuable. Human-only traits such as creativity, imagination, intuition, emotion and ethics will be even more important in the future because machines are very good at simulating but not at being. Yes, robots and software will do some of our work, but this will allow us to focus on things that cannot be automated. To imagine change squared, you've got to start engaging more with what might be, not just with what is. Immerse yourself in the immediate future, five to seven years out from today. We need to go beyond technology and data to reach human insights and wisdom. Technology represents the how of change, but humans represent the why. The future is about holistic business model. The opportunity is to be liquid, to learn just in time, not just in case, not single improvements, but complete transformations, not individual systems, but new ecosystems. Humanity is where true and lasting value is created. We will engage, relate, and buy things because of the experiences they provide, because of their transformative power. The future doesn't just happen, the future gets happened. The new way to work is to embrace technology, but not to become it. The future is in technology, yet the bigger future lies in transcending it. Let's live and lead from here. Um, that short video. Um, there's a great library of those videos. I mean, if you haven't already been uh, searching and, and looking at the language around this, then um, I would certainly encourage you to do so. When I was looking at that video, I was thinking to myself, we are at a pivot point in history. Humanity will change more in the next 20 years than in the 300 years before. Technology is now the defining factor of our society. Sorry about that. Yeah. If you were sitting in Paris in 1900, as we, we were um, a few moments ago, I wonder how much of that video would actually be able to be played with just a few terms replaced. And I think that's an interesting point, because we are going to see technology advances no matter what but it's how we adopt and adapt to those technology advances. And importantly, as the message I think clearly suggests, is that we are talking here about the humanity. And when I look around um, and consider where I am here in India with the, um, the amazing culture and the amazing history and the amazing concepts that you bring to the world, then the technology should be driven by you as Indians, as global citizens certainly, but we bring the human factor to it. It may not be humanity versus technology, but we need to keep, I think, that concept uh, uppermost in our mind. If you imagine that some of your students are going to be sitting here in 10, 20 years time, will they be talking about the fifth industrial revolution and saying it is the most amazing period of change that we've ever seen in the world? 
Well, I think we could say the same for the people sitting in Paris. We could say the same for the people sitting in the 1960s and 70s and 80s and 90s and now the 21st century. The fourth industrial revolution is indeed a great period of change. But we need to consider that change and understand how do we apply that to the benefit of humanity? How do we change economic systems? How do we change the value of labour in that economy? And as I said, we're, we are a society, not an economy. How do we start looking at the way each of our institutions can interact with us as humans for the benefit of humans? And ensuring that the humanity, that the, 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 the global citizenry is protected. And I think a final uh, closing point here is well uh, read, and I'll, I'll ask you to read this while I take a moment to talk about the optimism that we should have about this fourth industrial revolution. If we were students sitting inside lecture rooms, the lecture rooms that you participate in, that you provide, and this was the prevailing message, that we were talking about computer science impacting not just computer science, but impacting all of those wonderful disciplines that we embrace and, uh, and endeavor as part of the, the human story. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I, uh, I'm very grateful to have had the, the opportunity to share those thoughts with you. I, I hope that you found them um, uh, in, intriguing, uh, at, le at the very least. And uh, I look forward to uh, working uh, with you uh, over the coming time of the conference. I wish you well, and I hope that um, uh, you enjoy it as much as I'm sure I'm going to. So.